Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am joined by Stephanie Hill. Stephanie Hill is an Associate Assistant Principal at Passmore's Academy in Harlow in Essex and she's also an Ed Doc student at Cambridge University. Good evening Stephanie, how are you? Really well thanks Ross, really well. Is, is there anything I've missed that you'd just like to kind of uh, describe your life, your work in education with listeners to start with? <laughs> I guess the only other thing is that I'm originally from Australia, so that's probably a unique um, factor here. Uh, and I've been working in education in the UK for uh, coming up to 11 years now. So. Okay, and, and how long were you teaching over in Australia? Well, on and off, I've actually been in the UK since 2005. I went back and taught in Australia for four years. So okay. I, um, my first school was Passmore's Academy out of here. Oh, it's in your blood then, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so you are, you are obviously the, uh, you're following on from Vic, uh, sadly, uh, but it's our second, <laughs> our second guest from Passmore. So you're the most popular school on the podcast channel, which is good. Um, so can you, uh, what I do normally before we talk to you about your research, I just kind of get a general insight into your own life as a child in school. Um, can you give us a snapshot of your education from Australia? Yeah, I mean, I was, um, I went to a, a secondary school in a regional town in New South Wales in Australia. And um, I, I think that I was really lucky um, with, with my education because I went, when I went through school, everything seemed all subjects all curriculum areas were really um, equally valued so arts were just as important as English and maths and just as important as sport so I sort of went through school thinking that that all of these areas were accessible and fascinating and valued um, in in society which was incredible because then when I went on to, to university and studied um, English literature and history philosophy and, and psychology for me it was um, the world was open to me and I felt like that all of that right. was really valued. So how, how did you feel moving to the UK when you thought right <laughs> You, you, you are you're not that clever um what were your views <laughs> on that narrative over here in the uk yeah i mean it was a big shock i, I have to admit I, I, it is 20 years ago that i went through secondary school so i guess things have also changed in australia um a little bit as well now um sure. one of the reasons being that that we are unfortunately following the the uk in in the way that it values those subjects but yeah it was a, it was a big shock because mm -hmm. you i also um i guess i realized that that these subjects, English and math, seem to be valued a lot more highly than, mm -hmm. than subjects like your creative arts and, sure. and sports and humanities. And so we'll talk about that in a moment, your kind of life as a school leader's perspective and the imp Im impact on EBAC, particularly vulnerable kids. But uh, before we do, uh, could you describe your 16-year-old self when you were doing your exams? <laughs> um, I was a, a very avid student. I loved school. I, I was... Um, just as passionate and interested in art. So I would be found in sort of like the visual arts studio for hours and hours after school. Um, and I was also one of those students that, that loved being part of study groups and talking about Shakespeare and, and discussing right. sort of all the different interpretations. So um, I, I did well at school, but I did well- Did you hand your homework in late? And, and no, I didn't, no. Um, but I, I, I think I was passionate about, I, I had the ability to be engaged with the subjects that inspired me. Um, and I think that made a difference to me. Um, um, so, you know, in COVID, we're back, you know, autumn term recording this. How, how has Passmore's, you know, I interviewed Vic at the start of Vic Goddard Principal uh, Passmore's at the start of COVID in terms of government support and things. How has it been six months later? Mm. Um, I think that one of the things that has been a, a real challenge for us more than anything is um, being very hyper aware of the well-being of, of staff and students. Um, it's it's really easy to get caught up in the the whole the, the the narrative around there's gaps in learning we've got to catch up these kids are so far behind but but that doesn't help um, our young people and it certainly isn't going to help sort of their next steps and so what I think six months on what we've realised is that we we have we absolutely have to change the narrative around this and we have to focus on the fact that these young people are now going through um, a, a moment and a time in history that we probably won't get for another century How, what an amazing opportunity to focus on all the skills that they're going to learn and and what they can take out of that so and bring it back to the EBAC what's your school done with recovery curriculum learning lost you know the EBAC influences uh, give us some insights into life in secondary school 
Well, one of the things we haven't done is we haven't cut down any of the subjects that that are um are not part of the evac, and I think that was a really important decision for us. Um, so all, the whole breadth of the curriculum has remained as is. Uh, what we have done is we've offered students the, the time if they need to, to have that extra support in the afternoon. Um, but it's also been very much about um, let's start from where we are now and let's sort of move forward on where you need to go next um, rather than look at all the stuff you've missed and here's the gaps in learning. So really for us, um, it's 18 hours. it hasn't been a focus. Um, Sorry, it's my computer telling me what time it is. <laughs> Not, um, um, how are your Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and Google Google Hangout <laughs> skills these days? Google. Um, doing well. I mean, we've sort of um, we've actually had a little bit of both at, at school. There was a lot that went on, obviously, when we we're in lockdown. Sure. Um, uh, we have tried as much as possible to engage students um, online. So we're using platforms that, that allow them to access different resources and engage with, with staff, especially when they're off. Um, but the difference, I mean, what's been amazing about being back in school is that what matters most to our young people and what helps them the most is the relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and so actually having that time in school and then being able to... Sure and be around each other so, so on that note if I we rewind maybe uh, I don't want to offend you here maybe 20 30 years when did that relationship start for you where the the seed to be a teacher started <laughs> Um, I can't remember a time when I didn't want to be a teacher, um, right. but I wanted to be a primary school teacher and right up until the night before I was supposed to submit my application. So the deadline for applications at, at my um, degree in education were just about to close. I was lying in bed and I was like, what am I doing? I'm not supposed to be a primary school teacher. And so that's, I went into secondary ed. So yeah, it, I can't remember a time when I didn't want to be a teacher, to be honest. Fantastic. <laughs> so, and and how does it compare to life as a school? I know let, let's push COVID to one side for a moment. How does teaching compare to your life as a part-time school leader? So you work three days a week, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, the dialogue about flexible working, women in leadership, just, just give me some general th uh, thoughts there on those pressures. It's It was a challenge at first um, in particular because of my own self-management. What I was tending to do was I was in school for three days, but I was working for five. Um, and and so I really needed to take a step back and and for me it was about um, thinking about my own tendency to to perfectionism um, mm -hmm. that it didn't need to be um, everything didn't need to be perfect but also that um, we had a really great team around us so it was about sort of looking at how do we um, use everybody in the team and mm -hmm. and how could I sort of um, engage when it was needed um, and also do what I could do when I was there three days a week, um, but also recognise that the reason I went back part-time was because I really wanted to focus on research as well. Um, and that was important. Let's, let's talk about your research. Now for listeners, you're in your fourth year, fifth year? <laughs> third year. Third year. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're in your third year and doing your doctorate at the University of Education, Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, How's it going or how's it been so far the first three years? Uh, it's it's been a mix to be honest I what I love about um, being a part of a research community is the conversations that you can have and the people that you can meet um, what I realized um, from the beginning and the, the reason I first engaged with the Uni of Cambridge was through a master's in in ed leadership um, yeah. and I did that because I was so confronted with what was happening in the UK, I needed to understand it better. I needed to understand what was going on um, behind the scenes in terms of why the education system was the way it was. So coming back into the doctorate and, and being able to talk to people who were engaging with lots of different areas at um, a more extensive level, I guess, um, was really, really interesting. So for people, um, you know, dabbling with or start, starting out like me and, and you, I suppose, or for people considering, what, what kind of the highlights of things that you've learned in the last two or three years? Uh, I think for me, it was it was a lot to do with um, me being able to consider other interpretations uh, on what was going on. Um, it was it's it's really interesting to hear other perspectives, but they get really get you to question um, how you're looking at, at, at things. But also um, what was I don't think I had really started to engage with um, the way in which 
we're using research to um, to be able to connect that sort of bridge between practice and research. I, I think because I'd done my master's as almost a, a little bit more of a separate entity, whereas the doctorate, the practicing doctorate is, is very much about how can research inform what we're doing now and, and how is it making a difference? So, so, so on that note, you know, you're three days in, I'm sure the challenge is very real doing your research and being a, a, a busy family at home. Um, where, where are you today with your research? I know you're preparing for your upgrade, but could you give, uh, <laughs> as if possible, a, a kind of a synopsis of your research? Yeah, sure. Uh, it started out where I was looking at um, student leadership in, in professional learning. So uh, how are we mobilising student agency uh, to improve schools um, and to look at the way how effective learning was. So the early research was very much about um, a case study within my current school, looking at a team of students who worked alongside teachers to be able to engage in dialogue with them about what learning was like for them, how they learned and how that can be improved. Um, so off the back of that research, I, I published a couple of articles and where that sort of took me to, I guess, was a, was a look at the, um, the damage that accountability measures and performativity measures in, in the UK at the moment, the damage they're doing to both our young people and also, um, and also to staff, to teachers. Um, and then looking at, okay, is this a way where we can get a more meaningful a more meaningful insight into um, what is actually going on in school? What's the lived experiences of the students in, in the school in any given context? Um, and that was important to me because I think we live very much in the UK, it's all about standardising. It's all about the universal. So what are the universal expectations? What do um, the powers that be that think that education should be because actually that's the way they were educated um, but they don't account for a school that sits in northern England that has a very different demographic or context to what they might have in London so I really wanted to look at what are the how are we going to mobilize those lived experiences of students in a way that we can capture it and use it to improve. You know, the doctorate, the theory and the practice, what practical things have you been doing just to, to give listeners a bit better understanding of the kind of, I guess in some ways, how you might conduct a bit of research? Yeah, sure. Uh, so a lot of the, the current research that I've been doing is around setting up um, the opportunities for meaningful dialogue. So how can you provide opportunities where students can go into lessons and, and see what's going on and then meet with teachers afterwards and talk about um, what, what happens? And, and that needs to be more than just answering questions. It needs to be um, a conversation and a discussion. So co-generative dialogue which is the idea that you will come out with something that will move you forward afterwards um, is really where we started to, to sort of look at developing that um, and that's important so I would say to anyone who's looking at who's interested in in starting to engage students and bring students in the conversations about learning um, being able to look at how you provide those opportunities for that meaningful dialogue is a good place to start. Let, let, um, I know uh, probably five plus years ago if I put out on Twitter um, should students be part of an interview <laughs> process or in a lesson observation and then provide feedback to either the teacher or the interview panel what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> you know it's really interesting because we see that a lot more now but but one of the things that um that we've struggled with through this process and that you see in in some of the stuff that comes out as well on social media is well why should students listen to teachers teach uh, sorry why should teachers listen to students because teachers are qualified they're the experts um and and really what you're look we need to change the narrative around that it's not about students coming in and saying we're experts in content it's about students coming in and saying this is how we're experiencing learning um and this is this is what could happen to change our experience of that. And we can't do that as teachers. We don't have the- yeah, It's a fantastic uh, change of perspective, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. It makes so it uh, where are you now with your research and, and what do you need to do next? <laughs> so um, what I'm looking at now is, is I, um, I want an, a more of an international perspective. So I've been doing a little bit of work with the Konskap Skolan schools in Sweden. Yeah, um, and 
yeah, which are, are doing incredible stuff. But what I'd really like to, to engage with with them is um, how are they mobilizing student agency? We know so that for people that don't know about Cools Capsicle, and can you just give everyone a quick 30 second description <laughs> of, of that type of educational scenario? Sure, it's, it's a model of education that puts student agency at the center. So students are very much in control of, of what they do, what they learn and, and how they learn um, throughout from primary right through to secondary. So mm -hmm. it's very much empowering students and, and sitting them at the center. Um, and and what, 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 what is your, what's your current focus? Are you preparing for upgrade? Um, so I guess, what's the, what, what, I, I know some of the answers, but for listeners, um, is that a matter of refining, you know, 10,000, 20, 30,000 words? What, 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 are you, what are you currently doing? Yeah, it needs to be 20,000 words. So I've, I've sort of, I've got more than that at the moment. So it's about refining that. It's actually about looking at contingency planning because my research design had to completely change yes. when COVID hit. So I was originally planning to take a team of student researchers That's and right, myself yeah. over to Sweden um, because I would I want students to be central to the research process as, as well as part of the sample. Um, so now what we're going to need to do is look at doing that remotely. Um, so um, that hopefully will still be really effective because it's about now sort of setting up conditions where the teachers and the students within the case study school engage in dialogue with each other and I'll be able to see that remotely. Now I'm going to assume you're going to upgrade with no corrections and in the next <laughs> couple of years or so you'll have um, gone off and done your research and, and gathered some you know evaluations etc cetera, etc. Cetera. What, what impact, you know, in the future, what, 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 what do we hope to achieve from your research and what impact do you hope it might have? One of the things I'm, I'm looking at is the, the role of learning organisations in schools and so yeah. that, that, that idea that every stakeholder, every member of, of a school organisation is on a learning journey and everyone contributes to the improvement of the school. So my hope would be that through the research that we have a model where more schools can start to engage students in that in that process of teachers and students learning alongside each other. I know PASFOR's already do many of these things. Uh, give, give us just a, a kind of sense to listeners that some of the things, uh, and this prior to COVID, uh, it's come up some of the student voice stuff that your school was already doing really well, particularly with vulnerable kids. Yeah, so we have um, we have quite a few things uh, that, that sort of build into our student leadership network. Um, so we've got a student pedagogy team. Their role is to um, to work alongside staff to improve teaching and learning. We have our student council and prefects. We also have wellbeing ambassadors. Um, we have students who work at co with coaching other students in different year groups. So what we've done is is started to to bring together all of those different student leadership roles to create what we call a student leadership network they they all have a representative from each team and they meet as a student leadership team um, and they discuss uh, it's almost feeding forward um, to SLT um, what they think could be um, sort of included in in things that we want to improve on and focus on but also SLT can feed back and say okay we're thinking about this what do you think um, so I guess a lot of schools are already doing these things but we've probably just started to bring that together so that we're unifying it a bit more I guess. Right. Now, um, my, my passion's always been teacher workload. Um, just give you a sense, uh, you know, marking my insights drives every teacher crazy, but um, <laughs> can you just give us a, a, an indication of how COVID has shifted workload? What, what have been the pressures? Curriculums, lesson planning, uh, learning IT skills? What, what, what have been the pressure points? I, I think it's a combination of all of those. I, I mean, curriculum um, design has been one of our focuses this year. And, and that's a challenge when we need to look at is the, the curriculum that is accessible to those learning from home um, the same quality as those who are in school? And, and what are we doing at the moment to make sure that learning is engaging and inspiring, um, not just a whole lot of content because we're worried about. So, so I'd say that's probably been our main focus and, and the biggest challenge with workload, definitely. I'm putting you on the spot back with your research. I'm hoping you've sought your student views on the, the COVID experience and <laughs> um, learning online. What, what are our children saying? 
Uh, actually, one of the challenges that they're finding is there's such a, a wonderful, we forget about the, the structure that we provide our young people with in a school day, um, that actually the, the, the skills, organisation and metacognitive skills to plan and monitor their time and their days and what they're going to do, um, takes that takes a lot of time to develop that over many years and our current education system doesn't really provide the conditions for that. So when they're at home and they don't have that structure in their day, they're struggling. Um, bus to school, all that type of stuff. So yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So what uh, have you put anything in place to support kids with that? We're, we're looking at quite a few things. One of the things we're, we're trying to, to sort of develop at the moment is do we um, make sure that, that students are following the same school day that they would have? So when they, they log on, they're able to access a portal, they can see exactly the same as what the students in the lesson are getting. And we've also had some staff that are also doing video links directly into the classroom as well. Um, and so there's lots of things that that we can start to play around with, but it's one of those things, isn't it, that we're, we have to trial them, a lot of these things, before we can really implement them. And we don't, we need to be aware of the fact that these young people are at home now. Um, um, how are your colleagues feeling, you know, your teachers around you immediately? I know you're in a trust with four, uh, five or six schools, but uh, in your immediate school, just what, um, give us a sense of the pressures, the mood. I know it's half term tomorrow, but how are we all doing? I think that um, it's a it's been the most tiring term I can I can half term that I can remember sort of in my career and I think that that's what a lot of staff are feeling. Um, there's a lot of additional um, I guess energy is going to a lot of things that we probably wouldn't normally put it towards in terms of cleanliness and awareness of those around you. Um, but I think in the most part, it's being aware of each other and and aware of how students are feeling and how staff are feeling. That obviously is is more tiring than what it would be on a on a day to day in, in any other half term or, or year. So um, that's that's probably the main thing for us. So um, I mean, I'll, I'll pick your brains with some of my questions in a moment. Um, but uh, I get you know the the sense is with half term people are going to need to do lots of sleep and looking after them. <laughs> yeah. Now uh, we've passed the twenty minute barrier, and this is where I throw lots of quick fire questions at you. I, I want to try and catch you off guard, so. <laughs> How you do, and you can't pause or hesitate. I don't know if you're you familiar with Timmy Mallet. Oh, no, no. <laughs> right, okay. Well, I don't have a spongy hammer, but um, <laughs> I'll start off with something easy. Uh, what, what, what book are you reading at the moment? I'm actually reading um, Raising Boys by Steve Bidolf, which is a, um, he, he's talks about how we sort of look at um, the brain development of, of boys. I've got a one-year-old boy, so for uh, me, that's what I'm engaging in. Um, that's <laughs> right, in fiction books. What's that, sorry? In fiction at the moment. Oh, no, I'm not. But I, what I would like to do soon is I've got um, Gabriela Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude on my bookshelf. Um, I've read it in English. I'd like to read it in Spanish um, because I'm trying to sort of in, learn another language. I know a tiny little bit of Italian, but I'd really like to sort of um, engage with that a little bit. So <laughs> I haven't started it yet, though, Ross. Only seven days to visit Australia. Where would you recommend I go? Oh, East Coast. Um, I'm from Byron Bay, which is the northern part of New South Wales. So um, I'm a little bit biased, I guess, because it's got that beautiful combination of countryside and the beach. So sure. um, could you uh, <laughs> define co-generative dialogue? <laughs> Yeah, of course. Um, so if we, we look at something, we want to generate new ideas and new directions. Um, so that's the, the whole idea of, of generating from the dialogue. We do that in combination with, with other people, so in collaboration. Great. Um, what are your tips for teachers who want to go to their head teacher and ask them part time? I would say if, to start with, think about why you'd like to do that. What's the purpose for it? Um, is that actually um, something that is going to really help you with what you want to do next? Um, what I would suggest is that what we can't do is do that because we're finding everything's just too much. And there's too many teachers that are having to go down to part-time 
so that they can continue to work five days a week just to get through the workload. So um, I think it's really important to start off with the purpose for why um, and the conversation really then needs to be around is the part time to help you to be able to um, do other things or yeah, is the part time? Uh, so you're judging your researcher hat, your school leadership hat, and your family hat, <laughs> your mum. Um, yeah. What do you do to switch off and get me time? Actually, at the moment, um, just being able to play with my son is one of the most joyous things, like seeing him, he's just started walking. So they're watching him walk and babble and, and I just find that's the best way to switch off. It's like mindfulness, I'm just focusing on him. Um, and so for me, that's, that's the best thing at the moment. Okay, uh, one um, insight of things that you've learned about metacognition, particularly metacognitive planning. Mm -hmm. COVID, uh, any, any insights or tips? Yeah, I, I would suggest that probably what we don't we don't do enough as teachers is we don't actually think aloud and talk uh, talk about how we're thinking um, as teachers and as 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 we start to do that and we talk through our learning, we talk through the processes that we go through to discover new things and to work things out. Then students can start to do that as well. Piece of advice for a teacher wanting to start research, whether it's an MA or a PhD. I, I would suggest um, that. As you go through it um, and, and as you're starting, really think about getting being around people who are going to get you to question your own mental models. Um, so the way that you think about the world, get a, get a community around you that is going to continually question you and question that. That's the best way to start to get into research, I think. Uh, off the wall, what's that dream job you never had? <laughs> Oh, I, I can't imagine being anything else but, but a teacher or being in education, but um, one of my core values is creativity. I'm really, I love getting involved with it. everything I do. I kind of visually, it, it needs to sort of be um, sort of it, like I get engaged with, very engaged with that. So probably something in the creative industry, um, it would be, would be something I'd go for. Um, who would you recommend I interview next and why? This is a little bit of an outlier, this one, but I think that you should um, interview a group of students. Oh, okay, yes. Well, well, you will be the perfect candidate to help you get that set up. That, I'd be okay. <laughs> I've got one or two students on our podcast, but a group of students will be a first. Yeah, I think especially now. It's yeah, just absolutely. Well, let, let's, yeah. talk, let's set that up. Um, what's your number <laughs> one workload tip? Um, I, I have found that the best way to de decrease your, your workload is to empower students to be able to take the learning on more themselves. So peer evaluation, collaborative work, them knowing how to critique their own work and knowing where to go to next means that actually we become the experts in the room in terms of explicit instruction and guiding processes, but they are the ones that are taking the learning and, and really running with it. Um, and that just makes your job so much easier, but so much more enjoyable. Sure. Um, it's Halloween <laughs> next week. Now, I know it's going to be different, but if we were dressing up, what would be your costume? <laughs> oh, gosh, I'd probably I'd probably want to be something like Ruth Bader Ginsburg or something, I'd say. I'm a bit of a nerd like that. <laughs> okay. uh, tip for NQT who's struggling right now? Talk to someone. Reach out to someone. OK, advice to yourself to get that upgrade done. Uh, I need to make sure that I give myself the space. Sitting and having the space is the big thing. That's, this, that's my goal this week, Ross. <laughs> my final question, um, what do you hope to be your legacy, Steph? I think if we can, if the next generation of young people can actually create a, a, an education system where every single vocation and profession is valued equally. Um, I've been reading David Goodhart's um, head head, heart and, and um, hand, head, heart, hand and heart, I think it is. Um, if we can actually create a generation of kids that can do that, um, then I think potentially that's, <laughs> we've, we've done what we should be doing as teachers. Great. Um, Steph, it's been lovely to connect with you. Um, uh, sad we've not been able to catch up at our doctoral sessions, but uh, for listeners, we've got a virtual one in a couple of days. Um, I wish you all the best. Uh, with half term, have a great rest. Um, thank you for all your time and the amazing work that you do at the Passmore's Academy and Wider Trust. And, and what an interesting and fascinating research topic. Uh, wish you all the best with that. Thanks for your time, Steph. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it.